And now we're going to go from New York to uh, England, to the United Kingdom. Uh, we have uh, as our next guest, uh, Kenneth Woods. And uh, Kenneth is joining me. He is the artistic director of the English Symphony Orchestra, the Colorado Mahler Fest, and the Edgar Festival. Uh, welcome, Ken. Thank you, Martin. It's great to be here. Thanks for making time to talk to us. You have a very special project, uh, very apropos to what we've been talking about, uh, and bringing uh, Mahler to the world in times of COVID. Uh, tell us a little bit about your project. It's called Visions of Childhood, Following Mahler on the Path to Eternity. This is a project that started pre-COVID in uh, 2017. The ESO was getting ready to do a performance of the Erwin Stein arrangement of Mahler IV. And uh, that's always a tricky piece to program because on the one hand, part of the beauty of that arrangement is its economy of means, but there's very little else written for that same uh, instrumentation. So uh, after struggling for a little while, I thought, well, maybe the solution here is just to pick what would be the perfect pieces to go with Mahler for and make them for the same instrumentation as the Stein, which of course is not the original instrumentation Mahler himself used. So. That program was very similar to the one that ESO is doing uh, this month. With one exception, we uh, started the program with Schoenberg's arrangement of the Emperor Waltz, uh, which has now been replaced with uh, my own arrangement of the Siegfried Idyll. Um, and the piece, uh, it all fit together really beautifully. And I, I revisited the program back in December with the view to uh, thinking past what would have been Mahlerfest this year, where we would have done the second symphony, to Mahlerfest 21, where we were going to do the third symphony. And what does one do with the third symphony? And of course, the Mahler aficionados and fanatics here will know that Das Himmlische Leben, the finale of Mahler 4, was originally supposed to be the finale of Mahler 3. And there's all sorts of thematic links between the two works. And so it did seem like perhaps the idea of doing both of those symphonies at the same festival might be a little extreme, but could be just Das Himmlische Leben um, as a sort of prelude, because of course when he wrote Das Himmlische Leben, first of all he didn't know it was going to be in a symphony, let alone in two symphonies, and over a sort of eight-year period he, uh, he worked with the ideas in that song until he'd written two huge symphonies and finally found its permanent home. So the, the format of this concert is really uh, that idea of, of trying to look at Das Himmlische Leben itself as a focal point and draw out all the themes and connections that, that Mahler may have been thinking about. Okay, this is, you, you've provided us with some material I really want to share with our, with our audience. Uh, let's just see that segment from, from Das Himmlische Leben in your uh, arrangement based on the Stein uh, or instrumentation. Just wonderful, just just a wonderful uh, performance and arrangement. And you know, kein Musik ist auf Erden mit unserer Verglichen kann werden. And uh, you know that that just captures so much. I think of what what Mahler is trying to to do here. Uh, are we following Mahler to eternity? Does he take us there? Well, I think he does. Yeah, I mean, it's one of his tropes, and I would say of his major symphonic works, at least 
two, three, four, eight, nine, Das Lied von der Erde, and ten, all end with some sort of embrace of the eternal at the end. And Das Himmlische Leben is the sort of crowning of his early symphonic life, his early maturity, is, is one of the most personal and exquisite expressions of, of that uh, vision of what eternity might be. Mahler chooses to couch it in this incredibly, I think, unique way, at least for his time. It's, it's the child. It's the child's perspective on what heaven would consist of. And uh, it wouldn't be Mahler if he didn't have a child's version of what the opposite would consist of. Uh, and of course, he wrote a pendant very, very consciously here uh, called the, the, the Earthly Life, Das Irdische Leben, as well. And you've recorded this too, so let's just uh, refresh our memories a little bit with some of those sounds. Let's listen to Das Irdische Leben, just a segment. Wonderful that 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 symbol, the gong that Mahler often uses, is that last stroke of, of death. Uh, what was it like working with uh, with uh, Stein's original instrumentation? I mean, you set yourself a, a, a little bit of a, a you know some a framework within which you had to work. Was that comfortable for you as an arranger? I think uh, I, I'm one of these people who finds, to the extent that I'm creative, the more specific the brief is, the more creative I feel. Um, and, you know, I need deadlines and I need uh, some, some clarity. You know, if someone just gives me a blank piece of paper, I, I, I'm at a bit of a loss. Um, but also, I think I, the most important thing I ever heard about orchestration was from my friend, the composer, Philip Sawyers, uh, maybe five, six years ago. Someone was saluting him on his mastery of orchestration. And he said, the, the key to being a great orchestrator is to write good notes. And, and if you start with good notes, the orchestration will be good. And so I, I find the most important thing for me as an orchestrator is to orchestrate really good pieces. And that tends to make me sound like a genius uh, if, you, if you're dealing with music written by a genius. Tell me a little bit about uh, the musicians and uh, the wonderful singer you have here. Um, the singer is April Frederick, who's an American-born soprano, and she is the affiliate artist of the English Symphony Orchestra. Uh, April's really a phenomenon. I encountered her first about 10 years ago. I was supposed to be doing a performance of Shostakovich's 14th Symphony with the Orchestra of the Swan. And uh, a couple days before that concert, uh, we were supposed to do a Britain choral work on the first half, and the chorus pulled out. Uh, I think they found the work too difficult. To, something. So at the very last minute, it was suggested that she sing Les Illuminations. And uh, I said to my colleague, no, no one can sing those two pieces in one day, uh, rehearsing in the British manner on the day of, of the concert. The, it's, it, the, the vocal qualities required are too different. And I don't think any one person should ever try to sing those two pieces in their same career. The sort of real powerhouse Vishnevskaya inspired Shostakovich and this delicate, very Francophile Britain. But she was magnificent, and we've since worked together on many projects. She's uh, done world premiere recording of the Philip Sawyer's Songs of Loss and Regret with the ESO, which was a, a real high mark for the orchestra and created the role of Jane Eyre in Jean Joubert's opera of the same name. Um, ESO has uh, uh, been my orchestra since 2013. It was founded by William Boughton in the early 80s, and he really built it up into a major force for discovering lesser known uh, British music, particularly of the first half of the 20th century, first recordings of lots of Finzi and Delius, Bridge, Bax, Ireland, that sort of stuff. Um, and also he was very canny at identifying significant later generation British composers who maybe were out of fashion. Uh, so he managed to have a long-standing uh, partnership with Michael Tippett, 
Nicholas Ma, Lennox Barclay, uh, all during their lifetimes. And uh, so when I joined the orchestra, I thought that was a, a legacy worth building on. My predecessor was, was Vernon Hamley, uh, who had died in 2008. And then they'd gone through a period of, of trying to work with different guests before I joined. But I thought basically Bill Bouton had it more or less right. Uh, but then I wanted to bring to the the mix of programming my own fascination with Mahler in particular and the generation of composers after Mahler, particularly the sort of Antarctica to Musique generation of mu musicians who were influenced by Mahler and whose music was was largely suppressed and, and lost in the in the decades after Mahler's death. Um, and uh, it, it's a wonderful group of players, and uh, we were just absolutely determined to get everyone back and playing together again after COVID as early as possible. We were the second or third orchestra in the UK to return to work. I think the London Mozart players beat us to it, but uh, uh, this was one of the very first things we did. And uh, you can see lots of smiles in, in these performances. I think everyone was just overjoyed to be making music together again. Yes, it's very noticeable in the, in the takes that I was able to see. Uh, you know, your, uh, this program consists not only of arrangements instrumentally, but also compositionally, which Ooh. I think will raise some eyebrows. I think it's a fascinating uh, example in our next segment here. We want to play just a little bit of uh, Di Forella, uh, like you've never really heard it before, I think. <laughs> It kind of takes your breath away when you hear the quintet storming in after the, the vocal part there. Uh, what did you have in mind and, and how, are you gonna get, how are you getting away with this? Uh, that's a good question. Well, we'll see if I get away with it. It was so much fun to do uh, and so much fun to record. So uh, what we've done with the entire work is uh, alternate verses of the original lead with the variations. And it was just a really fascinating challenge to knit the two together. Of course, there's all sorts of challenges with keys and, and stuff to, to be resolved. But it was, it was just an absolute hoot to sort of think, you know, what can I take from the quintet that will really underpin or comment on the text of the song in, in a humorous way? And this is one of Schubert's most uh, cleverly understated bits of musical satire, I think. You know, there's a, a lot of edge in Di Forella. Uh, it's not just quaint and cute. And so I think we can draw out some of the subliminal messages that are in the song. And, you know, if, if I see Schubert in the afterlife and he's cross, I'll, uh, I'll buy him a drink and, and uh, just say it was <laughs> I don't know. not to I, do. I, I, I think we approach things sometimes way too sacrosanct. I think this is, you know, this is all part of uh, enjoying, exploring, celebrating the music. Uh, I think it's a, I, I like these kinds of uh, variations that I don't expect. And so I thought it was uh, quite enjoyable. Um, do we're going to have to move along, but I wanted to just bring out an obvious parallel. You know, uh, when Evenstein did these arrangements, he did this out of a necessity. Uh, this was a performing society that uh, was uh, was not going to be a full orchestra. You've done it out of necessity and from a very different angle. Um, what is the future of music making if if uh, if we're stuck with this for a while? How do you see this in a in a in a in the COVID world? I can remember learning about these arrangements from the Society for Private Musical Performances in the 1990s, at which point they were very out of fashion. And I was amazed when I discovered them, how good they are. And I, so I think uh, my first interest in them, and I've been doing them since then. Uh, I've, I've recorded Schoenberg's arrangement of Das I von der Erde and the, the Lieder eines von Gesellen, uh, is, is that they're just fascinating on their own merits. And hearing great music in different contexts is always fascinating. You hear different things. You know, when you hear Mahler's arrangement of 
the Death and the Maiden Quartet, you hear different things than in Schubert's original. It doesn't make it better, it just makes it different. And when you hear, say, the Ruchert leader on the piano versus the orchestra, you hear different things. In a piano work, you tend to hear more of the dissonance, more of the chromaticism, more of the harmony. Of course, you lose some of the, the sonority. Um, in, in COVID, I thought, you know, with lots of orchestras doing these sort of socially distanced things where everyone's in a box at home playing to a click track, I didn't think that was really worth pursuing for the orchestra. We have such limited resources and I wanted whatever we do during COVID to be of lasting value. So we're trying not to duplicate programs other orchestras are doing. You know, we're not going to be doing the 7,000th performance of the Lark Ascending this month. Uh, we're doing new arrangements, new works, working with our affiliated artists and trying to think of, you know, what are those dream projects we've been wanting to, to do for a while. And of course, in, in the virtual reality world, you can encourage people to take risks they might not do if they had to pay for a ticket and get a babysitter and park the car and everything. And so we're hoping that maybe people who like our Mahler stuff will be more inclined to try our Elgar stuff and people who like our Elgar might come to one of our storytelling concerts and, and families that have watched one of the storytelling concerts will come and watch this. Uh, and that by the end of this period, we'll have a slightly more uh, open-minded, braver, curious audience and a, and a body of work that we can look back on and say, that was, that was a good use of the time. And, and hopefully yeah. this is a, a step in the right direction. I think it's fascinating. You know, I mean, most people have, have looked at Mahler as an impossible uh, composer to perform in this period, but there are in tremendous arrangements. You've shown us uh, some examples here. There's a fully choral version of Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen. There are uh, chamber uh, versions. There are also arrangements of Mahler symphonies that some of them were done during um, his lifetime, including two piano and forehand versions of his symphonies. Uh, it would be wonderful perhaps to try to come up with a resource in which all of these Mahler arrangements could be uh, looked up online. We're sort of uh, thinking about uh, doing that ourselves. So if there are uh, any, is there any input about what Mahler is out there for a uh, chamber or a smaller ensemble, that would be wonderful to, uh, to have that as a resource. And well, indeed, of course, they yeah, the, the existing resources tend to be driven by publishers who only want you to know about their own arrangements. But uh, there is a lot out there. We're going to do the Klaus Simon arrangement of Mahler 9 later this year, which we're, we're very excited about. Uh, but there, there is a, a, an absolute ton, and uh, all of it has uh, interest and merit. Uh, and not all of it is necessarily in this uh, sound world of the Society for Private Musical Performances with the Harmonium and Piano. Ian Farrington, who's a, a well-known British uh, arranger and orchestrator, has done most of the symphonies uh, in, in a much more sort of classical orchestra uh, style yeah. with no keyboards. And, and, and those are also fantastic arrangements and very, very effective. Well, uh, it's been fascinating to learn about this. I have one more question because I know this is so important to what you do and what you think. And, uh, and that is this, this, you know, these pieces aren't chosen by accident they're interwoven. Uh, you uh, think of programming as more than uh, these are the, my four pieces for the concert. Tell me a little bit about your philosophy of, of programming here as, as, we, uh, as we wrap it up, because it's an interesting topic. Well, I think always you feel like uh, if you've got an audience's attention, you know, you want them to first of all have a good musical experience, but also to come away from the experience enriched in, in some way. And Mahler is maybe the most interesting single figure I can think of in terms of sitting at the center of a nexus of visual art, history, music of the generations before him, his influence on musical development in the generations after him. Uh, and so it, in his case, it's a particularly rich uh, world in which to, to work. And it's a great pity if, if the best you can do is just to stick the Greek piano concerto on the first half. Uh, alongside a Mahler symphony. Not that that's not a, a beautiful piece, but uh, Mahler, especially now that he has a sort of built-in audience in many parts of the world, ought to be a conversation starter. And I think the philosophical essence of what the Mahler symphonies tell us uh, is is more relevant than, than ever. And, uh, you know, so for instance, in, in Das Himmlische Leben and Das Irdische Leben, you know, this is not about going to heaven and seeing a guy with a beard and people with wings on their backs. Uh, hell, the earthly life, is a world, our world, of poverty, of pain, of dislocation, of children suffering, 
and heaven is the opposite. It's a world without cruelty and a world without need. Um, and if we just, you know, even come away from one concert reminded that we have it within our power to create this sort of Das Himmlische Leben that Mahler talks about, you know, we don't have to wait to die. We could do it here, uh, you know, and, and, you know, why make a, a hell of our own creation when we can do the opposite? Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, very much, of course, in accord with what the foundation is trying to do as well. It's been wonderful having you as our, our guest today, Ken, and uh, good luck with the project and what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks a lot.